Thank you. Um, thank you, first of all, for, in, uh, for the invitation. I'm really happy to be here. This is the um, first time I'm participating in this Naira thing. Um, my talk is in two parts. First of all, I'm going to talk about the game, the online game, the adaptive game, and then I'm going to go on to the actual stuff that I'm supposed to be talking about today. <coughs> I have lots of slides, so uh, uh, bear with me. Uh, First of all, I'm a linguist. That's my background. Uh, and I work in the multidisciplinary uh, department. I'm very glad to, uh, and happy that I, I am from that kind of department because there we can sort of, this interdisciplinary ideas come to, uh, together. And without this kind of department, we would not be able to do anything uh, such as this kind, kind of game that we've done. So I'm a linguist. We have educationists. We have psychologists. We have special education. We have mathematics. Uh, IT people, obviously, and all these things, uh, statisticians. So, bringing this excellent team together, I think they're excellent, uh, I'm going to talk about the um, game. Uh, background. Um, the first talk was pretty much, the, many issues are the same because we have online adaptive games, so oh, I'm so happy to hear that you have the same kind of issues that we have. Um, but anyway, um, mm, <coughs> so, this game was developed for children who have specific problems in learning to read. So they have real challenges in learning to read. This is not for everyone. You know, they, it's the, whole, the game doesn't cover the whole reading uh, sort of uh, practices. So, and this is the background why we've done this. Um, uh, uh, problems in reading skills really affect learning in general because much of the learning is done in, in written format. So early support is important. So our focus is right from the beginning, just before they enter school, from that age, to try to uh, provide them some support in learning to read. And, and I was in the Uvascular Longitudinal Study of Dyslexia project, and we started from birth. You know, that's the early support. No, that, that's Heike Lutinen's uh, project. Um, you might have heard of it. Uh, here we had 100 infants from families with dyslexic parents. 100 infants from families with no reading problems at all. And we followed the, the um, uh, uh, sort of all, many things. We, we did lots of different types of testing with these children right from birth, and they're now 21 years of old, these children, and we're still following them. And they're lovely. Um, and and they're classmates. And um, one of the findings uh, about this uh, research is that just by knowing the letter knowledge prior they go to school is a really good indicator how well they learn to read. So just giving letter sound uh, <laughs> tests before they go to school. The, the blue line here shows the children who had difficulties at the end of their uh, grade one in learning to read. And they were much worse in the letter knowledge prior. To, because here's the age, ages from three and a half to six and a half that they were measured, the letter knowledge. So, this information, Heike in particular had an idea that, okay, we have this information, we should do something about it, you know, uh, to, to help these children, because they are going to face uh, reading problems. So he came up with the idea of a game where these kind of uh, connections would be um, uh, practiced. So basically the game is um, an online game where sounds, speech sounds, are connected to written formats. Very simple idea, on surface. Lots of things happen at the underground. Sort of. <laughs> anyway, so here you might hear uh, mm, and the child has to go and uh, click the one that corresponds to that uh, sound. It's always letter sounds, never letter names, and it moves on the syllables, rhyme units, uh, words, and sentences. And the game is now from, from the preschool to, sort of, let's say, grade four children. That's the extent. Even though we have uh, adults who have who's used this who are like a second language learners. So, and we have different kind of um, graphical sort of backgrounds so that they think that they're playing different kind of tasks that it's not motivating for them. And it, as a game, it's got so, uh, different kind of motivational um, um, aspects and uh, reward systems. So a little bit of this method. Um, 
So basically, as I said, it sort of trains very systematically the consistent and frequent mappings between letters and other written symbols to corresponding, corresponding speech sounds. And it's multimodal, which is important. It's always visual and auditory. And there's a straight connection between these, these two types of uh, st stimuli. And, and it's repetitive. I'm just going, this, this is just to make, there's lots of, lots of issues here. <laughs> I'm just giving the main points here. It's repetitive, so it's tireless companion, uh, a training companion, and it's um, implicit. It gives you implicit, that, okay, this is how, this is a task, try to figure out what happens. But if children uh, face problems, they have, there's some um, explicit sort of training uh, components in the game as well. And <laughs> it's intensive and it's a really focused training environment. And it always gives immediate feedback on the, on the action. If you do some kind of selection, you know if it's correct or incorrect. But it focuses on positive feedback. It doesn't give you a sort of, oh, oh no. What it's always a, okay, it just went red color or something. Next, and next uh, trial is exactly the same so that you would be able to sort of know what the answer is. And always, the, if you make an incorrect selection, you hear, mm, and you select something else. But then it should sort of place you the correct sound. So you, the sort of, you, there's a sort of right mapping there for you, that you don't leave with the, your own wrong mapping. So it always gives the correct answer to you. And it's, there's time restricted, restricted and untimed un, uh, multiple choice trials in the game. Uh, so it's dynamic and in, in individually adaptive, which is great, but also a really horrid thing when you start analyzing the data. And we have a sort of challenge level of about 80% of correct and 20% are sort of difficult for that particular child, so that there is that challenge, but also feeling that it's not too, it's not too frustrating because you don't know any of the, it's, this is particularly for those children who have learning disabilities because they do get feeling of not being able to do things enough in their life. Uh, we have also assessment in the game, so that is, is uh, a sort of yeah, dynamic and a static assessment. And, and it's, it's, it's like a typical response to intervention model with the exception that the cycle of refocusing intervention can happen within seconds rather than in months. Like usually just the first do the training, then it happens and let's then do fix something after, after you've done the results, uh, after you see what happens in typical sort of clinical work and interventions. So you can play it any time on almost any device and uh, continue from where you left off in the different uh, computer or mobile phone or whatever. And it's cost effective because this, it's really simple to use and usually reach the, the target within hours rather than months. So Graphicam is a learning and teaching support. Teaching support, in, especially in, in the places where teaching uh, is, is somehow challenged, like in some countries in Africa where we are. Uh, it's assessment tool, as I said, but here is we focusing on as a research tool. It's fun because lots of data comes out of it all the time, but we just don't know what to do with that yet. <laughs> ah, so it measures the accuracy scores and time measures, um, and um, and children can monitor and their teachers can monitor because it's an online game. So that's pretty much the same as the previous presentation. Uh, we, our approach is uh, to give sort of evidence-based intervention and therefore we do this kind of experiments, inter experimental interventions where everything's controlled. We know this is the group of children, they're playing at that time, this amount of time. We do pre-testing, post-testing and follow-ups. That's how we do, but it's also online game so anyone can play the game. But this is just to give evidence for ourselves that we believe that we're doing something helpful for these children. Uh, short playing sessions, because we don't think that they should be paying too long time uh, with this kind of cognitively demanding tasks. Um, uh, this is uh, just an example of the data. Uh, the red line there shows the children who have played graph a game. And this is only like 
I, I can't remember if it was it six weeks of playing time, and uh, letter uh, accuracy and letter uh, sound scores, uh, letter names of sounds. And there's uh, two other groups. The blue line is those children who did not play anything at all during that same time. And the uh, green line is the children who played math games that we have developed, which is exactly the same, but with math uh, content. So you can see that by playing the game, the skills developed that they actually trained. So um, we also done some um, brain-based analysis, uh, I mean, data collections, and, and only after three and a half hours of gaming, this is just pre-school children, uh, I mean, children who are just going to school, and these are pre-literate children. There's sort of a, this print-specific uh, network starts to emerge on, in the, this visual, uh, this, uh, right occipital temporal lobes. So that's very interesting as well. English study showed as well that the standard score gains in sort of the word list uh, reading task, uh, the gains were per hour is far in excess of the standard score gains per hour considered to be evidence of uh, e e effective reading interventions. So we are quite confident that this game is doing what it's supposed to be doing. Um, and well, what is this? This is a map. Yeah. <laughs> this is a map. This is Finland over there. And that's where we start. We have about five well, less than six million people in our country, and uh, about thirty—I don't know—is it fifty thousand in year one in in, in school year? So, so that's sort of the scale. That's why we don't get to that kind of numbers as you do, <laughs> and we are focusing on the very sort of specific um, early stages of reading skills. But anyway, we collaborate with um, lots of colleagues, and we take the game to different orthographies, writing systems, and the connections to written uh, spoken language. Because as you know, English is a bit different. I mean, you probably don't know about Finnish, but <laughs> Finnish is very transparent uh, language, so that each sound is always marked with the same, exactly the same letter, wherever in the word it is. It's really easy. Once you figure out the 24 letter sounds, you know how to read. Children know how to read by, the, by after two months, any pseudo words or anything. OK, not the case in English because the mappings are so that sort of um, inconsistent. You have to learn bigger units and stuff like that. But anyway, so we have some projects. I'm just clicking on this because it sort of goes viral here. Um, Africa is one of our um, uh, sort of focus area at the moment because they specifically need help there in this kind of support uh, due to many uh, issues. So. We've done collaboration in many parts of the world and continue to do that. And everywhere we go, we take a, the same kind of evidence-based uh, approach that we have to see first that the game works before we give it to the general public. At the moment, the game is only in Finland available to the general public. Because the, these are just small studies that we've done with like a uh, few hundred children, so we need more evidence. We're quite confident that it works, but we still want to do it. So now, that was Graffa game. <sighs> now, now is the thing that I'm supposed to be talking. So we have that game log data available from this uh, our Graffa game server. Um, <coughs> virtually everything that the child, the, the player does in a game is logged. Uh, there's timestamps for every action. When the game starts, what what happens in the uh, what was the selection the child made? What was the what were the alternatives in there? In what order? All these are are sort of <coughs> locked and in the in our game logs. So we get play, uh, information about played levels, displayed items, selections made, exposure times, and respo response times, and. And they, these files are then sent to our uh, local um, game server, and and then we start analyzing the data. So we have hundreds of thousands of learners at the moment. I've, I've been doing this ten over ten years now, so that's one of the backgrounds. I forgot to say we are much lower than you. So 
since 2005, I've been doing this. I've been, I'm a lead, I lead this graphic game team, and um, we've gone slowly from one language to another. And um, we have, like, in Finnish, we have 100 versions of the game because we are researchers. We, do, we have a specific research question, and we do a different kind of version of the game. So we develop new versions of the game. Uh, so we have, <laughs> we, we, this is how many players we have yesterday. This is the figure I uh, came up, and didn't get, came up, I found out this information. And so there are millions of trials because of that. And abroad, in different languages, is much less at the moment, but it's expanding all the time. So plenty of data. And this is something that you can see on our um, uh, website, uh, server. You can see the date that the game was played, uh, how long it took to play this particular pre-assessment task, and this is the accuracy percentage. And it goes level by level, and you get masses of this, <laughs> this kind of uh, views. And, and this is about... Uh, individuals, players, one game trial. Uh, it says that the result was incorrect when it was played. Um, was the letter lowercase, uppercase, and correct answer was ah, but player's answer was d. And then you get the items that were sort of shown to the child at the time, the player. So you can see what was the incorrect answer. And then we get these Excel files. When I press that button, and then our server guy calls me. Excuse me, Ola, could you please modify your <laughs> your entry because the server can't handle it. So it's just it's, it's lots of data. So what we need to do in this kind of um, environment, we need to understand the type of data that we're dealing with. What is it? Uh, you, you sort of told already about it then, that we, in principle, we know what's in the game, but um, what each child goes through, you have to really look into it because the game, because it's an individual adaptive game, so and each child has their own uh, player character and whatever, so they. The game, who's play, if, if another child plays next to you, it could look completely different. You know, so it's a very individualized game. And they have to stick on with their own uh, player character. So uh, variation is huge. Uh, and because we give the adaptive level to 80%, sort of the uh, correct uh, level, I mean, the answers that the child would do is about 80%. So ch some children have items that are... Uh, have like eight distractors, one correct answer and eight distractors, and they can be whatever. But then another child can have just like two items. There's a 50-50 chance to get it correct. And sometimes we even show just one. I say, mm, which one is? There's only one answer. So, you know, just to get that, that they have to learn it what it is, because they just don't get it. But I, I don't believe that by just repeating millions and millions of times the same thing, you would learn it. You have to do something else. I mean, this is a learning support that we're giving. Teachers are much better at teaching than this game would ever be. But this is a very good companion. Teachers really like it because it, is, it does give that training that is impossible to give in the classroom for each individual child, you know, a specific, the, specifically those children who have problems. So... So it's a learning support, uh, and uh, but never a replacement of a teacher. So here I'm just showing you the <coughs> that there are the learning content types are sort of uh, already give some kind of idea what kind of data you have. We have a. Um, mm, I'll go to the next one. We have. <coughs> Basically, two main categories of um, learning content types and adaptation systems. We have several sort of minor uh, categories and under each, each uh, 
major category. This is an uh, example from the set levels adaptation, uh, an English game where the game has been constructed so that, designed so in that way that in first level, in first stream, those, those items are sort of displayed to every child. Every child goes through the same items. How many times they repeat it is a different thing, and how many distractions they have or whatever. But they all go the sort of same levels in the same order. And we have thought about how to, what kind of, because uh, for instance here, the SIP is the target, then the rest of them are the distractors, the ones that are shown at the same time. And they all act as a distractor to each other. So it's very sort of um, set in stone what, what they've been shown. And this is particularly this kind of a, uh, inconsistent uh, orthography as English has that we cannot just give all the letter sounds and just display them whatever, uh, with whatever other option because uh, letters, mm, they are sounds that are, can be connected to many different letters. So there has to be restrictions. So this is, I hope you understand, what, I can follow what I'm saying. That, and then there's a proceeding criteria when you can go to the next level. Okay. But then we have a different kind of system where we have some, something like a, a dimensional uh, adaptation system where we, we have categories, th three main categories, uh, letters, letters and syllables and words. They, they put it in together. And the game randomly select from each category items. And it can go really quickly from one uh, main category to another. Just if by knowing a few vowels and uh, consonant sounds, it can go to syllables that are made of the same kind of uh, sounds, and then move on to words, and then go back and forward you know, uh, in the system. So from one uh, category to another. And and this game goes on and on and on. There's no levels that, uh, that the child has to go through. So these are, oh, that's interesting. Right, and now, so those were the type of adaptation, main adaptation categories and the, and the learning uh, uh, content. This is an example from our, our Cypriot um, colleagues. They use Scruffer game in Greek, and they, uh, the, uh, Christina Tisti uh, did her PhD last year, and these two, three slides are from her work. They wanted to look into the game log data as well. They did the particular, uh, the, the post, uh, pre and post and follow up sort of paper to pen assessments, typically to intervention studies. But then on top of that, they wanted to have a look at the, what happens on the game logs. Like, can they get more information on children's uh, learners' uh, performance from there? So they came up with this kind of a microgenic analysis, analysis framework, where the, there's a mathematical model where, where it takes into account the performance, the concept of performance. And they had this kind of a set levels uh, content in the game. So they were able to say that how well a child, the player did each level. So accuracy percentage, basically. That was the performance concept. An effort concept uh, uh, that sort of corresponds to the energy or resources of the player for a specific task. Taking the time, the response time, and how many times they had to do the task. Okay, so putting those two, get, two uh, concepts together, the performance and effort, then they, you can't really use the raw scores because they're so different, especially response times between different subjects. So they, they use the ranks of, for each participant, so relative ranking. And, okay, uh, they use the histogram profiles for subgroups for each task and level pairs. And in using these metrics, they were able to sort of see that, or visualize the difference in the performance in different type of tasks. Um, <clears throat> 
So it says that the framework visualizes the progress of each individual and each group across different stages of intervention in terms of individual, individual performance and effort histogram profile. And uh, uh, this basically helps to understand the effects at different points of the, uh, oh, the, the game, I mean the data. And this is just an illustration. You don't have to look at it too carefully. The two top ones are group means of, this is the performance, and on this side is the effort. And they use two different types of games. They use prep, which is their sort of own game, which cognitive uh, abilities trained game, and a graphic game is the red one. And the number of tasks is on this uh, x-axis here. So you can see that there's a difference in, the, in the, the performance at the different parts of the task. At first, mm, uh, oh no, that was the wrong way. They, this, they used both games. That first they used, in the blue line, they used graph game first, and then they changed to prep. And in the red line, is the, they used the prep game first, and then graph game. Okay, so the cognitive task, the red line there, was difficult at first, but then it got easy easier, and the other way around. And here is the effort, the time it took to do that. This just illustrates basically the difference in the di two different type of uh, uh, games. And this is the individual score, uh, individual, individual child score, how it changes across the task. And you can see that uh, it reaches like Peak at certain times, so you can see when certain game doesn't is not effective anymore. That there's no learning happening after that. Okay, now we move from this. That was a controlled study. Uh, we move to a graph game in Finland, and uh, the game is free uh, online, and is supported by the Ministry of Education and Culture. And here we have some kind of a plotting of the data. I think there's about there's only 500 children in this one, but this is letter letter sounds. How they learn letter sounds, uh, you can't see really the the x-axis here, but uh, the the purple line there is the mean. But all these are the individual learning curves for these children. So there's big variation in the data. This shows. Uh, <laughs> because I know what's here. So it, this is about 40, level 40. It means that um, within an hour, they have reached, they learned the letter sounds in Finnish. Uh, same with um, uh, learning syllables. It just, and these black dots show that where the game has been finished. Some you, because this is, you can use it at home or wherever. You can stop the game if you're not interested in the game. So the black dots show when the child has, or the player has stopped the game already, that they haven't played after that. So it's a messy data in a way. And this is a word. So, and now this new project that Heike Lutinen leads, Dyskepra, Dyslexia, Genes and Brain Project, they're particularly looking for children who are resistant to training and graph game training who don't learn. Even if they play the game, they still don't learn. It's actually quite difficult to find those children, but, <laughs> but we, are, we are learning uh, something about them. So this is a mixed uh, adaptation system. There, there's this dimension that it just takes from letter sounds, syllables, and word, but it also has set levels in between the game as well. And these set levels are repeated at least 57 times. Uh, and, and the set level is, is comprised of the letter sounds that the child did not know at the beginning in the pretest, that they were difficult for that child. So the same six items will be presented 57 times during the game. So it's different to each child what particular letters are there. So we have different kind of game types. Um, uh, 16 different game types, mini games. Uh, and as I showed you already, the basic trial game is that you hear the sound, oh, 
and you have to go and select one. And if you make a mistake, there's a less distractors in next one and less and less and less. But in this particular set uh, game level, there's always the same distractors and targets. So it doesn't reduce, whatever your answer is, it doesn't make it any easier. So it's a very sort of set um, system. Uh, we have different types of where you form, you hear word, and then you have to form the word. And then you have a game where you select all the l sounds, and there's lots of things. And so there are different type of, uh, the nature of the game is different. That sometimes it's much more motorically challenging. You have to quickly go and select something. And sometimes it's much easier that you just have two items, that you, uh, and one of them is target. I'm just going to go quickly through this. Um, uh, like this, it just shows that you hear the word arsi, and you have to go quickly go and uh, collect the arsi, and it, more bubbles come all the time. It's, it's really a nightmare. I can't do it. And then it, <laughs> but the point is that it's, it's exciting because more and more uh, letter, uh, sounds comes and letters comes. Okay, and you can also do like, um, this is actually French, uh, do the uh, sentence uh, uh, formation. We have assessment task, like this is a particular letter assessment task. You hear one letter and you have to uh, combine, uh, find the target from the whole lot of items. And this is what, as a linguist, this is interesting. <laughs> um, here are the target letters, are, uh, letters and those um, this way are the actual answers. This is from the 35,000 children. And if it's correct, if um, you can see S is the target, and the red area is, here's S as well, so it's been a correct a selection. And then there's some lighter red sort of in squares like here that sometimes P is uh, being confused with B, which is phonetically quite simple to guess why. But this is quite neat that th there's not that much confusion. Um, uh, but these sounds are very difficult to M and N, M, N, to discriminate. So more confusion has happened in those. So this is another way of uh, visualizing uh, the confusion of the target and distractors. In the middle is the target, S, and here are the distractors. And this sort of um, uh, shows the discrimination probabilities of the, of, of, of the child. It, it calculates the, the, the confusion probabilities. So the inner circles, if someone, the, this green thing was, it would actually be this one. Here, if, if it's red and close to the to uh, target, it means that it's been confused with the B. If B has been target, it's been, P has been selected, and D as well. So those are the, confu you can see the confusion, but they're closer to the target and they're redder. And 50% and probability, 75% and 100% probability. So the further in the edges they are, the better the <coughs> child has uh, known the letters. Okay, right, just more of this. Quickly, um, I just took randomly one player among thousands of players, and th this is the information we get. It's a boy, it's registration date, uh, playing time three hours, accuracy percent is 86%, which actually tells you something about the adaptation and the date of birth. 141 game levels played, uh, that many correct selections and much less incorrect selections. Average response time, three seconds. Median time for correct response was 2.6. Median time for incorrect response was a bit longer. So it wasn't just quickly doing, uh, sort of responding to the incorrect ones. And the letter sound knowledge assessment task at the beginning was 10 letters, which is sort of average in the first, uh, Although actually, a child who's not that uh, sort of uh, hasn't really learned much yet at the beginning of year one, and in 19 letters at the end. Right. So, so I picked up a couple other children with exactly the same scores: 10 uh, letters at the beginning and 19 letters 
uh, the end of the game, that, or up to now, what they played the game. Then we have something called learning index, which one of our uh, uh, group members have uh, developed. And there's a sort of complicated uh, mathematical code for that, somehow he's come up with this index. But it takes the target and the, what was the answer and the distractors into, in the calculations. And it comes with that kind of index. And for this child player A, B, and C, the index is 3.9, player B is 3, and player C 1.9. The smaller the index, the uh, less they've been able to learn in the game. So this is a player A. These are the levels, and these are letter uh, sounds, and there's some extra things at the top. That we don't have that many letters, but there's sort of a minimal pairs at the end. Anyway, so it, 40 levels, and or less than 40 levels, this uh, player A has learned the sounds, pretty much. Um, these are then preset. I, I was telling you the preset items, that they had the six items which they didn't know at the beginning in the assessment, and these have been repeated 53 times, and this is the accuracy percentage, so it's started from, from low, 58, and increased, but there's some dips every now and again. So I just did this kind of a, a trend line for that. Uh, the, the red dots here shows the sessions, because in one session you could do several uh, levels. So those are the trend lines for this chart. And this is the matrix, the confusion matrix for that particular player. There are much more sort of a, a confusions. If, if you, these are the targets and these are the, what the actual answers were in this particular chart, but not too bad. Um, and here's now the player B, which had pretty much the same kind of index, learning index. Uh, the curves are similar, but not the same, but pretty much the same. And this, this is the accuracy, accuracy percentage on the set items. And this chart really learns uh, quite quickly. Within our, and this is the confusion matrix for that player. They are some, different items are confused by different individuals. That's the point. And this is the information you can take into providing the, uh, improving your uh, intervention. This is the third child with the learning index was low, which we think is resistant for training. Uh, there's 240 uh, levels that this child has played. And the beginning part is the <clears throat> up to 60 levels, that's still with sort of 16 letter sounds. It's much less than the previous ones. And the accuracy, percent, accuracy percentage in the set levels is low as well. Okay. So, and this is the confusion matrix. Quite confused. Yeah? Lots of confusions. So this child really needed. So uh, my time has ended. Yeah, but um, I just wanted to say say that um, we have challenges in this kind of naturalistic data collection because we don't know who played the game really because they don't need to they don't need uh, another child or adults could play or whoever we, we just get the game logs we don't know so there are lots of um, things that we have to take into um, uh, but the possibilities, I think, are still great. That we could somehow get to the next level and learn to understand how to analyze this kind of complex data. I think we have to have multiple approaches, uh, look at the data really carefully and re-look re at it and see that we're not just inventing things in there. And, and how to find controls. I do think that we still have to do some kind of uh, uh, ex experimental studies along with this. It's, you can't just use these things for face value. Um, so our, our approach, we, we, we're getting some interesting things there, but the individual level processes analysis has just began, and we could not have done this with our, with our small team from Agora Center. <laughs> So we have lots of uh, 
uh, research and development partners, which have actually increased since I've done this uh, slide. So thank you for your attention. Sorry, <laughs> too quick. <laughs> Thanks very much, Ella. That was very interesting. And it's a, a good contrast and an interesting contrast to the first presentation. The next presentation is the last one that will be on um, online games, uh, but from another perspective. So, uh, questions on Ella's presentation, uh, please. Tom. Uh, do we know anything about retention? Ret <coughs> they, uh, they acquire this skill, the graphs seem very convincing, mm. but how long do they keep it if they go away? Yes, the follow-up, we have done follow-up uh, uh, in the experimental setups. We have done follow-up uh, assessments. And uh, after three months and a year, and even after a year, in the Greek study, for instance, the retention was still there, that they had, uh, they were, their skills were above the, the group that had not done the graphical uh, game intervention. Thank you for your interesting talk. <coughs> um, so there are many, many ways to uh, um, build adaptive systems, and it's not completely clear now to me how do you build in uh, the adaptivity, how it's, how it's done. How adapt? Yeah. Oh, okay, that's a good question, and it's quite complicated. But uh, because we have, as I said, we have many uh, two ma major types of uh, adaptive systems. The one is the dimensional ones, where we we have ordered the items. In especially the letter sounds in order of difficulty, but the syllables also the sort of a in in complexity they get, it's increasingly complex. So we have some kind of pre-order of the items which have, we have tested beforehand, and then the algorithm there thinks that okay these items if the child makes uh, has a correct choice then they are put in a certain category, and after after they done three correct choices then it's considered as learned. And if they make one mistake and then it goes in unlearned category, I didn't probably answer your question, but there's no. the algorithms in there. Rebecca. <coughs> Thank you. Um, this is possibly a question for both speakers, actually. I mean, I do know that obviously there's a lot of challenges with collecting this online data because you have no controls over when or where the context and all that. But with, with the size of the data set that you have now over time, would it not be possible to start modeling some of that because you have time and interaction and changes in patterns? Uh, I mean, is that something that either of you have tried or others have done that you could start to model different contextual factors or, you know, hypothesize that people were working with somebody else at certain times? Well, I can answer from my case that we just about to start modeling. We've been so busy with uh, developing new game versions so that we haven't had really time to go into that. Well, we now got different people coming into our group which are more interested in and know about modeling. So they are, their eyes are sort of shining. Oh, I can get to see what kind of patterns and models that they can do in this game. But not, not, nothing that we can sort of show yet. <laughs> Um, I have a question, actually, about. Uh, uh, sorry, was there? No, it's he. Okay. Um, I just had a question about uh, the, the structure of the game and, and financing that sort of game because it's expensive and so on. And so it was interesting, Johan, that they charge a small amount and they move to that stage. Did, have you thought about that? Well, we have to go to that direction because uh, ten for ten years now, the Ministry of Education and Culture has uh, funded so that everyone can have the game for free. But it, um, it comes to a stage now that we have to take it outside from that system and start sort of a, probably get some kind of micro, um, I don't know, this is a nightmare trying to think, because we just research it, we don't want to think about uh, business things and how to get, we just want to do research. So it's very difficult. <laughs> Yeah, it's yes. and it's, it's a moral thing because we think that uh, like learning to read is is a is a right rather than something that you would have to pay for, especially for those children who who uh, struggle with that. So okay, let's get some more money from it. Only those children, uh, parents who have money, they can get the game. 
And especially if we go to Africa, they're, they're not going to be able to pay for this. So it's a little bit like the uh, graduate study in Finland. Things are changing with the uh, Finnish economy, perhaps. <laughs> <laughs> Great. Uh, yeah. Another question, please. Ah, Emma. I think this may have been answered partially already. So your red and pink graphs, mm -hmm. you found out really interesting information that put and uh, and mm. are, and are as mm. confusable. So does the system then adapt to that? So then that learner gets more put de to distinguish. Yes. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yes. Yes. Because they're the difficult items for them. Yeah. yeah. So this is kind of related to that. The first talk mentioned this 75%. You need 75% correct, otherwise kids get frustrated and bored. And you mentioned 80%. 80%. Yeah. They're pretty close. Yeah. But are they? Um, is that fairly arbitrary, or is there some data on that that the motivation drops off? Do you want to answer? Yeah. So they, they are three difficulty levels, and they can choose it uh, by themselves. And it appears that young children uh, choose the easier levels. It's still adaptive, so it, uh, it's not e really easy, but e easy relative to your own level. So if it's 90% correct, you, you will have 90% correct properly. Mm -hmm. And younger children prefer this, but also there's also an important boy-girl dif uh, difference. Uh, uh, the uh, sex difference, uh, it, that's strong too. And, uh, so, uh, but we leave it now to the subjects themselves, so what they like. And uh, some they, sometimes they change this over day, all the time. They, they like to play with it by themselves. And which way is the gender? Do the girls like to be right more? Uh, the boys take more risk. <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah. 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 yeah, yeah. They take the higher risk level. Yeah. yeah. So I think that's pretty much the same. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, all.